So there's a hint of something that could really shake up cosmology. But how excited should we be? Should we be? Uh, how cautious should we be? What was Desi found? And and how confident or sceptical should we be about this sort of hint of something exciting? Yeah, so we've been asking ourselves this question quite a lot. And we're both cautious and excited, if that's a good answer for you. In 1998, astronomers made a groundbreaking discovery that the universe is accelerating its expansion, driven by a mysterious dark energy. But what is dark energy? Well, exciting new results from DESI, the dark energy spectroscopic instrument, may help us reveal an answer. So with me to try and understand these new findings is the one of the spokespersons for DESI, Carl Dawson. So welcome, Carl. Great. Thank you for having me. So why don't we start with what is the sort of big mystery that DESI is trying to solve? Or what do we want to know about dark energy that we don't already know? Okay, so the big mystery that DESI is trying to solve is exactly what you highlighted in your introduction. The big mystery is what is this dark energy that's so pervasive in our universe today? What is the cause of it? What is the source of it? How does it evolve with time? What is its fundamental nature? And by measuring the impact of dark energy over different times in cosmic history, Desi can start to suss out the answers to that question. How is it evolving with time is the fundamental thing we're trying to test um, because the standard model for cosmology, um, one that's derived from Einstein's theory of general relativity is one where that dark energy does not evolve with time. Its density is constant over all of cosmic time. And that's the fundamental thing we're trying to test. And we're doing so by making precise measurements of the universe's expansion history over as large a range of cosmic history as possible. So let's move on um, to Desi. Can you tell us a little bit about the instrumentation? Like what is it that is able, enables you to achieve a better uh, accuracy than has ever been done before? Yeah, so DES is a spectrograph. It's, a, it's literally the instrument we put on the telescope. And there's two aspects that make this more powerful than what was done previously. So one is really simple. The telescope is bigger than the last generation experiment. So the last generation experiment that did this measurement was from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And that uses a telescope that was two and a half meters in diameter. Uh, DESI uses a telescope that's four meters in diameter. So we're literally just collecting photons more quickly. And the second component that makes it more powerful is the robotic fiber to, uh, positioner technology. In the Sloan Geo Sky Survey, we had a human being basically place fibers, 1,000 fibers at a time, in the location where the telescope would focus a galaxy or a quasar. So you could do a thousand at a time and you had a two and a half meter telescope collecting the photons. Now, instead of having a human being place them in ahead of time, we have robots doing it in real time. There's 5,000 robots instead of a thousand. So we can now collect five times as many objects as possible uh, with a telescope that is much larger. And when you take those two in combination, it's about 10 times faster than the previous generation, which was the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. All right, so let's go to the results. You've just released, uh, is it the first year results? Is that right? Yeah, we finished our first year of observation. We completed all the analysis and we released the results using this barren acoustic oscillation technique on Thursday last week. Right, okay. So there's a hint of something that could really shake up cosmology, but how excited should we be, should we be uh, how cautious should we be? What was Desi found? And, and how confident or sceptical should we be about this sort of hint of something exciting? Yeah, so we've been asking ourselves this question quite a lot. And we're both cautious and excited, if that's a good answer for you. Um, so what did we find? So we're testing whether or not this energy density is constant with time or if it's changing with time. Um, the best model for dark energy that's been assumed for the last like 25 years, ever since basically this, the, the discovery that you mentioned back in 1999, is that it's this cosmological constant. And the cosmological constant just says that the energy density of space itself uh, is fixed with time. Dark, dark energy has a fixed energy density over all time. And that is actually a prediction that comes out of Einstein's general relativity. And up until really recently, there's no measurement that's questioned that. 
assumption. Every measurement of our expansion history has been consistent with that model for dark energy. So there's two reasons. One is that any deviation must be really small from what that model predicts. And two is that the experiments just haven't been quite sensitive enough. Now, what are we finding and why should we be excited and why should we be cautious? So what are we finding when we use any one of three techniques, either our technique, which we'll, I imagine we'll talk about the Baron acoustic oscillation technique, the Cosmoid background, or type 1a supernova, they all have a very slight preference for a dark energy that evolves with time rather than one that's the cosmological constant. But no Does measurement it get weaker or, or stronger? Getting weaker. They all are in the same direction where it's getting weaker with time. That's right. So the acceleration of the universe is not as strong in these preferred models as one would be expected for the cosmological constant. Now, each of them by itself is also consistent with the cosmological constant. It's only when you start combining samples. And the first sample where we have only two measurements, one from the BAO and one from the CMB, there's no questions of what to use. That alone is already starting to put a little bit of hints of tension on the cosmological constant. So in classic units, we would say the discrepancy between those two, the, the model that describes those data and the model that describes lambda CDM is 2.6 sigma. Um, we have a lot of discussion about what's realm for excitement, right? Um, 2.6 sigma is not yet in the area where we'd say there's real evidence that the model is wrong and we need a new model, but it's getting close. You know, we start saying there's evidence for a new model at three sigma. So we're kind of, we've never been in this regime. Our previous experiment was not this, was not favoring lambda CDM at this level when you combine with CMB. So then, just to clarify, lambda CDM is the standard model of cosmology with a cosmological constant and dark matter. Yes, that's exactly correct. So the lambda, right. in that is the cosmological constant, and the CDM stands for cold dark matter. Uh, so that's the prime. Those are the two primary components of the universe in that model. Um, so yeah, we see at two point six sigma tension with that model. We favor this model where. The universe is, expand, is still accelerating, but not as quickly as one would be expected for that model. And then we can combine with supernova samples. And there it becomes a little more nebulous because there's more than one supernova sample. And we can't combine the supernova samples. They're all kind of, you have to treat them one at a time or individually. And they give slightly different results when combined with our data. And it's straddling that regime of evidence for tension. So if I combine with one sample, I get a 2.5 sigma tension, very consistent with what we see with just CMB and BAO. If I combine with another sample, it turns into 3.5 sigma tension, which is now past that three sigma threshold where we can start citing evidence that the model is wrong. So we're kind of in the superposition of these two states, and it's really not clear what regime it's exactly in. So I can literally be both excited and cautious simultaneously. <laughs> I mean, that's the nature of science, isn't it? <laughs> Often, when we're the <laughs> I wasn't of expecting experiment. this to be the result, to be honest with you. But yes, it, it, can, it is definitely the nature of science in retrospect. What were you expecting? I wasn't expecting to have multiple supernova samples, first of all. And our measurement, I was expecting the supernova sample, that was the 2.5 sigma discrepancy, to be the only one we could use. And we'd already done comparisons with that data. Um, we did it in our previous BAO experiment and did not see this level of tension. So I was really expecting something kind of comparable to that, that measurement that, we, that we're seeing with just that 2.5 sigma supernova sample. So can I just probe a little bit what these BAOs, baryon acoustic oscillations, can you explain what they are and why they're relevant here? Yeah, so baryon acoustic, oscill baryon acoustic oscillations are the feature in the distribution of galaxies that we're measuring. Uh, yeah, sorry, galaxies and quasars and lamin alpha forest. And these are imprinted from the very early universe, from the first 300,000 years after the Big Bang. And they are effectively the same wiggles that we see in the cosmic microwave background, power spectrum. Uh, but those are present in galaxies and quasars in the lamin alpha forest, all the distribution matter for all of time. 
and they're at a fixed scale. So because they're at a fixed scale, we know exactly that that scale, it's about 500 million light years in radius, um, they can be used as a standard ruler. So just they allow us to do surveying across cosmic time. And they're very faint. We can't just measure them by looking at the separation of two different galaxies. You have to measure millions of galaxies and compute the average separations between all those and compare that average separation uh, to what would be expected for something totally random. And when you do that, you see this little extra probability of a separation at about 100, like I said, about 500 million light years. And that's the Baryon Acutis oscillation feature that we're measuring. Um, with that measurement, you, you have this ruler now out at different times in cosmic history. You can measure the angular size of that ruler and therefore measure the distance to that ruler. And that's the key goal in cosmology is measuring distances as a function of time. So just like the equation of motion, you can measure how the universe expansion is changing with time with that, that relationship. And that gives us an answer to, is dark energy a constant over time or does it vary over time? Which is the big question we want to know, right? Exactly, because the exact nature of dark energy will tell you how those distances are changing as a function of time or as a function so of redshift or whatever it is. There's another sort of tension in cosmology at the moment, this Hubble tension, the difference two different ways to measure the expansion rate of the universe and they should come to the same answer and they don't. And does this uh, result, if it, if, it, if it turns out to be a firm result, um, would that have anything to say about that tension? So absolutely, yes. It's a little subtle. When we do this measurement, we actually also get a direct estimate of the Hubble constant as of today. Um, with these, this preferred model, so, so the two, what are the two techniques? One is where you just do geometric measurements locally and then bootstrap out to fairly nearby supernova. There's really no assumptions about physics. It's just that you assume you understand uh, luminosities, you understand angles. Um, and the hard part is just getting everything right as you bootstrap from, from tracer to tracer, tracer out to higher and, red, higher, and higher redshift. So it's, the technical aspects of that measurement are hard. But the physics underlying it is straightforward and doesn't leave any question of what the result should be. It's just the technique. Our technique is the opposite. We have the standard ruler I mentioned. That's the, this, the separation that's measured in the Baryon Acoustics Oscillation features. And we have an absolute calibration of that based on our model for early universe physics. Our measurements are actually very simple to make. And it's the assumption about the underlying model that must be questioned if um, our measurements consistently lead to a different value than the local technique. And that would be really exciting because it means the model needs extra components, which are not included in our model for physics. So what do we find? We still find, with or without the cosmic background, we find a tension with this local measurement done by the SHOES collaboration. Um, we're consistently around 68 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And you can so turn the, the knob That's the value of the Hubble constant that is measuring the rate of expansion of the universe, that number there. That's exactly right. So 68 is the number we keep finding. Um, and it fluctuates around that value of 68, depending on what data sample we use, um, whether or not we allow the universe expansion history to be flexible, um, what happens if we allow it to be maximally flexible with this time evolving equation of state for dark energy is it actually drops a little below 68. Uh, and the exact value depends on what supernova sample you use. Uh, but it still remains in tension with that local measurement of H naught. Right, right. So let's go to the even bigger question. Um, let's suppose, let's put our optimistic hat on and, and say this... Uh, new new potential changing dark energy is confirmed what would that mean for the origin and the fate of the universe because right now people say okay it's going to expand forever and we'll have a heat death but that doesn't that assume that we have a cosmological constant that never changes that's exactly right so what we've been saying for the last 25 years is exactly what you just said that the universe will transition to something that's completely dark energy dominated that dark energy is the cosmological constant and it'll accelerate 
at an exponential rate, or sorry, it'll expand at an exponential rate for the rest of time. And that's where we're left, right? That's what we're left with. In this model, it's not quite as extreme as that. Um, because as I mentioned, we don't have that exponential expansion that that cosmological constant model predicts. I think it's impossible to extrapolate too far in the future because we need we need to translate this simple test we've done um which is really mostly like a local measurement to see how it's deviated from a constant energy density it's impossible to extrapolate that too far in the future without a more explicit model for what dark energy is so i can't predict further ahead what i can tell you is that the rate of expansion seems to be slower than what would be predicted in this cosmological constant model if the if so would it be what right, you're seeing is correct. So would it be right to say if if that is confirmed that the fate of the universe is more uncertain than what's been sort of sold to us? Yeah, I would say it's much more uncertain for sure. Right. Right. Okay. So then let's get down to the the, the, net, the most important question. I think is okay. This is a you know two point six sigma. It's not quite a discovery. It could go away. A lot of things that look exciting turn out to you know go to dust like the bicep results how will we move forward and find out is this real or is it just you know a spurious result okay so this is again the the whole topic of conversation in our collaboration right now so what i mentioned earlier and what you asked was this was the measurement from our first year data sample our third year data sample we now have almost three times as much data actually completed on sunday so just or sunday eight days ago sorry today's april 8th so we locked in our last photon that we can then use for the next analysis we have to go through the processing we have got to redo the analysis but we're all in agreement that we want to do this as quickly as possible using techniques that have already been established on this first year data sample and really use the increased precision to get closer to the truth on this this equation state for dark energy. Uh, so we are all looking forward to that. I can't give you a date on when that will happen, but it should take less time than it did for our year one sample. And a year one sample took about a year. Right. So we're to, talking to maybe months away, probably. Um, less than 12 months away. <laughs> <laughs> and then what about other projects outside of DESI, like, um, Nancy Grace Roman Telescope and um, Vera Rubin Telescope, like, would they help at all? Yeah, so what I'm actually most excited about those is what supernova samples they can produce. Um, if they can produce a really high quality supernova sample where it's all in the same you know, frame, they're all taken with the same instruments and you have great light curves, I would like to have a sample that's really superior to what we have on available today uh, to drill down on what are the differences due to the supernova results? Um, so that's one thing I'm excited about with those projects. I'm also excited about new analyses of the existing supernova samples. So when I quoted those two different results, uh, the 2.5 and the 3.5 sigma differences from Lambda CDM, those are from two different groups who analyze a supernova sample that has a lot in common. It's not totally clear what the differences are, but I suspect a lot of the differences are in choice of analysis. So if they can, can converge on how they do the analysis and really um, improve upon the measurements they have, which are already excellent and well thought through, that would be nice to have that, sec that third robust probe to tie to this equation state for dark energy, in addition to BAO and CMB. Great. So we will look forward to exciting new results, even over the coming months and, and years. Um, Carl, thank you so much for all your help and uh, can't wait to hit, see what happens next. Great. I really appreciate being here, Phil, and I look forward to seeing new data as well. <laughs> Thanks.